Hello, Russia. Should I start? We can start. Yeah, I can start. Okay. So, um, great that you have invited me to, to give this talk. And of course, I regret it a lot that I cannot be there in person. But I hope that uh, with the opening of this uh, Ocean Center for the Arts and Humanities, which is about uh, digital data, that also this digital medium uh, will serve as well. Um, I will uh, uh, say something about uh, our experiences here in the Netherlands with uh, research data services and infrastructures for the humanities. If we go to the next slide. <coughs> First of all, a few words about um, the rather long timeline that you can see there that starts already in the 1960s. Um, it is important to realize that um, research data services originated, I think, in, in close contact with developments in the humanities and the social sciences themselves. As they became gradually digital, also the need to do something with the data, to make it available to a wider audience, to archive it, to reuse it, um, became more necessary. Uh, researchers themselves became aware of the value of the data that they collected and processed in their research. And a lot of this reuse was to make, for instance, comparative analysis possible, also to validate the, research, the results of earlier um, research, or for secondary analysis to answer new research questions with data that were already existing in digital form. So at the bottom of the graph, I try to give some of the developments of data services as they originated over time. Perhaps the oldest ones date back to the 1960s when the social sciences started to use um, uh, surveys, uh, digital, digital surveys, to digitize survey data. Um, um, in the 1970s, we see the first uh, electronic text archives uh, start. And um, my own roots uh, go back to 1989, when we started the historical data archive in the Netherlands. And um, also in the UK, at that time, a historical data service uh, started. And then again, later in the 1990s, we see, for instance, archaeology data archives uh, begin like the archaeological data service in the UK or the electronic depot Netherlands archaeology here in my country. And now since the 2000s, 2010s, we see the development also of all kinds of university repositories and general data sharing facilities, on which I will also say something how we relate to that. But first something more about the service that I work for, which is called DANS. Next slide, please. So DANS stands for Data Archiving and Network Services. We are an institute of the Dutch Academy um, and of the research funding organization, NWO, and we're set up in 2005. The mission of my institute is to promote and provide permanent access to digital research data and information. However, our first predecessor dates back to 1964, when the Steinmetz Foundation was set up, um, which worked for the, more for the social sciences than for the humanities. And in 1989, I already said, the historical data archive was created. Um, so I think we can boast, and if you press enter or next slide, you will see what happens then that we have an experience of now over 50 years in this area of research data services. Next slide. Our main services are depicted on this slide. Um, and there is three that are the most important. Um, on the top left, you see an impression. I think the, the, the text is not really readable. But it's an impression of our long-term electronic archiving system, EASY, um, which is a self-deposit system where um, researchers from the humanities and social sciences can deposit their data for long-term preservation and data sharing. The second service on the right is an impression of Dataverse. Dataverse, we 
position for short and intermediate term storage of research data in collaboration with a number of universities. I will say a bit more on that later on. And on the bottom left, you see Narcis, which is the gateway to scholarly information in the Netherlands. And again, it will return a bit later on. We have a couple of additional services. Perhaps you have heard about the data seal of approval, which essentially is a quality um, seal for digital data repositories, um, which had a cradle at Dams, but now is an international endeavor. And there is a couple of other services as well that you can see there. I only want to name that we um, also um, are quite active in training and consultancy. For instance, training um, uh, university staff and staff of university libraries in all kinds of matters related to research data management. Next slide. Oh, sorry, I forgot one uh, to mention. Uh, next slide, so once more, please, to the next. Yes. A few more words about the long-term electronic archive, um, where we now have over 30,000 data sets published um, from the humanities and social sciences. I don't know if you can read on the top right side the numbers there, but humanities are the, the overwhelming majority, and that is mainly because archaeology stands out. And why does archaeology stand out? because this is the only domain where the, um, the whole data management has been regulated, even in uh, European and national law and regulations, um, where uh, archaeologists are simply obliged to make available not only the finds that they find, to the, that is for the state service of archaeology, but also the electronic uh, documentation and uh, electronic um, excavation um, uh, results and data sets that are related to that. So they are the biggest part in our archive. Um, and you can see perhaps, if the letters are not too small, that other areas are behavioral sciences, geospatial sciences, uh, life sciences and medicine is um, an, an upcoming domain that we are starting to service. So far this is fairly small and uh, two other subsections of the social sciences. Let's continue to the next slide, which gives an uh, impression of the growth of the archive. And you can see there is really, um, in a way, a, a, a slow start. Uh, I already told you that the roots of our uh, data services go back to the 1960s. Um, and until, let us say, about 2008, that is the time that really um, um, uh, 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 the amount of data started to grow. So um, now we are uh, already past the 30,000 data sets, and a data set actually can be seen as a collection of files that belong together, usually to one research project. One data set can consist of a um, uh, only one file, but also of dozens or sometimes even of thousands of files. And therefore, the number of data files is much higher. Um, I don't have the uh, actual numbers at hand now, but I expect that we are now well over 3 million data files, uh, which are um, uh, in uh, uh, some 30,000 data sets now. It is also interesting to see that um, there is a lot of talk about big data um, these days, but you could say that the humanities are characterized more by small data or the long tail of research data, as it is also called. You can see in this graph that um, only a, a small section of our data sets that we make available, um, so about 2%, is bigger than 2 gigabytes and 3% bigger than 1 gigabyte, and that the overwhelming majority is quite small. Small, of course, is always relative. Um, for instance, um, one of the data sets we have is the, the, the complete um, population census of the Netherlands in 1960, and that would fall somewhere in the middle of this graph. It has 
for then we had about uh, 11 million Dutchmen and the total size is between 200 and 500 megabytes so about the size of what fits on one uh, CD-ROM um, and um, that's is, that is almost the middle of this graph. So the majority of the files is, rel is relatively small that characterizes us, I think. Is the data also reused? Um, and yes, I can say it is. Um, we, although the, the research, not the, the reuse numbers do not run in the hundreds of thousands or in the millions, you should see that the, uh, we, we are focused on professional users, professional uh, researchers from the humanities and the social sciences, and the total number of those is not that big in our country. I would say that we have about 50,000 professional researchers in the humanities and the social sciences. And, um, and given about 30,000 data sets, you can see here that last year we had almost uh, 45,000 uh, reuses, downloads of data sets, um, which means that um, every data set was used, let us say, on average one and a half time. Although we do have big hits, which are downloaded hundreds of times, and there is of course also data, like also in a library, you have books that are borrowed many times and books that are barely ever borrowed. We also have data sets that are um, uh, used, um, that, that have not been used uh, in the past year. In the five graphs of the, ah, sorry, you should go to the next slide. Yeah. Ah, and again, one more. I forgot to say next slide two times. Excuse me for that. Um, on the right hand of this graph, um, you can see two pie charts that indicate the, um, whether the data is openly accessible or whether there is some kind of restriction. We at DOS use the motto, open if possible and protected if necessary. We aim at making data as openly available as we can, but there can be also restrictions. The restrictions can be of different kinds. There can be restrictions because of privacy. Um, there can be protections because we need to protect archaeological heritage. If we present data on a very detailed level, people with their metal detectors could go there and disturb the archaeological site um, even before the professional uh, archaeologist can, can go there and dig there. Um, but there is also a group of files that the researchers themselves want to be protected. And we do allow for this, at least until um, there, is, um, um, there, there can be a certain embargo period. But there can be some other restrictions as well. As you can see now, at this time, about uh, two-thirds of the data is openly accessible and 25% has a restriction group access, that means only professional users are allowed. And then the yellow part of the pie um, is um, where you have to apply for permission, which is usually granted. And only about 1% of the data is really closed. Um, that can be really confidential data. And that needs to be um, uh, closed for, for instance, a couple of years before it can be opened, or because it is available at an other location, not with DOS. We have a couple of those as well. Now the next slide. And well, I could talk for a long time uh, about this slide, but I will uh, keep it relatively brief. This is just intended to give an impression of the kinds and the variety of the data that we have in the archive and that is made available, which comes from projects of very different origins, backgrounds, and intentions. Uh, so number one um, is um, we have a big collection of historical shipping. You know that the Netherlands has a rich history of um, uh, international trade, for instance, in the golden age of the 17th century, lots of ships um, uh, went uh, uh, to both the, um, the Far East, where we had our colonies, um, uh, later also to the West Indies in South America, 
but also the sea trade with, uh, even with Poland and the Baltic Sea was very important. And we have many data sets related to um, that subject. Another group is digitized historical censuses, uh, of which we have a lot of um, information. Um, there is a big project called Clio Infra that is working on global inequality in collecting data on um, mainly economic historical indicators over the past two centuries um, that we are making available. We are collaborating in the uh, European Holocaust research infrastructure, um, trying to connect and make available lots of um, European Holocaust um, information. And we participate in a data bank on dendrochronology, um, again, mainly archaeology and archaeological and art historian, where data about tree rings um, across Europe is collected and um, stored and shared. Next slide. Um, ah, this slide again gives an impression of the openness of data sets across different disciplines. There are uh, substantial varieties. Um, note that the left hand um, uh, axis on the top of this slide is logarithmic because archaeology, which is the first bar, is such a big group in our archive. But you can also see that in this group there is a lot of the information is, um, is open, um, uh, almost uh, or more than 70%. And for some of the other disciplines you can see the variations of uh, restrictions and openness. Let us continue to the next one. Um, which is a further breakdown of the use, again, the logarithmic scale on the left-hand axis. And as you can expect, because archaeology, archaeology is the biggest collection that we have, also the number of downloads in that area is the biggest. Um, and I will not dwell on the details of this graph, but you can see that, we, uh, that the reuse um, for the um, um, social sciences is on average um, somewhat higher than in the rest of the humanities. Let us go to the next one. Now I want to say only a few words about our second main service. I mentioned it already in the beginning. It is called Dataverse. And the Dutch Dataverse is also called Dataverse NL. This is a service that we run together with the universities um, and using software that was developed by the Institute of Quantitative Social Sciences at Harvard University. And this system is now being used in um, uh, a couple of countries, even in, uh, except for the United States and Europe, even in China, to store and uh, disseminate and share data. Um, until now, this is still a starting service for us. You can see, perhaps at the bottom, I don't know if you can read it, that there is now only 337 studies in Dataverse NL and about 1,000 files and about 3,000 downloads, which is, which is relatively few in comparison to the easy archive. But the difference here is that the universities themselves are in charge um, DANS offers this service as a back office service. We run the system, but the universities are responsible for the content. We have 13 universities in the Netherlands, and so far eight of them collaborate in this initiative, um, which is mainly oriented to data management during research and for the archiving of the data let us say, up to about five or ten years. After that, the data will move to easy or another one. Next one, our third service that I want to mention. Again, only one slide about this one. It is a very broad service that is not uh, really an archive, but it harvests the information that the universities have in their institutional repositories. And also, on their research information systems. 
So this is an interdisciplinary service, not oriented just at the humanities. It gives a, sort of a total overview of the publications, the data sets, the research project, the researchers, the organizations um, that are active in the Dutch universities. And you can see that we have now about 1.2 billion publications and about, in total, a bigger number than an easy, 150,000 data sets. This is because we've also harvested a couple of other data services. A very big one within this is the so-called language archive of the Max Planck Institute in Nijmegen in our country. Uh, it's part of the German Max Planck organization. It's very close to our border um, with Germany. And they have a lot of speech and language data sets. That the number is so big is because um, uh, every, let us say, individual study often contains one speech file or one uh, video file with speaking people, often connected to transcriptions and other uh, uh, sources. But that information uh, in itself is then one data set. And they have a lot of that kind of material there. We are in the process, by the way, of archiving this material also um, at Dutch. Uh, because um, the data, the language archive, is uh, heading in a somewhat different direction in the future. Next slide. Now, I don't know how that is in Poland. It seems to be a European ph phenomenon, but um, in, in my country we can see an increasing awareness uh, on the importance of research data. Perhaps that has started some five years ago, more or less, and is still growing. And there is an awareness also on the need of data policies, that um, organizations should um, formulate what they need to do with research data, and that researchers also should make a, a data management plan on, um, because it is viewed as a valuable resource that is being produced, not just as a side product of the research, but perhaps even as an important product in itself. Not only the publication is important, but the research data as well. And therefore you see all those organizations that I put there on this slide, and there is many more, that have formulated um, uh, statements or policies um, uh, on, on what should happen. Um, the European Union is doing this, for instance, also in the Horizon 2020 uh, program. They say, if you want to uh, apply for uh, a project to get funded from Horizon 2020, then you should uh, make a data management plan and you should accept open data access as the standard. Um, it is so far still a pilot, but this pilot is probably going to become practice in uh, general uh, quite soon. Let's move to the next slide. And now I'm gradually moving a bit uh, wider than just uh, my own institute does. Uh, because we should admit and see that actually if we look at this data landscape, um, that it is quite fragmented. And that it is more like an archipelago than the polar landscape that the Netherlands is known for, that is very organized and where every bit of land is used and well uh, arranged. Uh, no, it is more like, a, like a, a Swiss or a Dutch cheese with many holes in it. And that is, if we move to the next slide, why we set up Research Data Netherlands as an initiative of a couple of organizations. We do that with the academic networking and computer facilities organization SURF and also with the data center of the technical universities to try and cover uh, collectively all of the research landscape and to provide uh, data services for them. The graph on the right hand side on the top um, gives an impression that we see this as a layered um, affair in which you have services on different levels so to speak and with different roles for different players. Um, 
At the backbone, at the very bottom, you have the hard computer, fa computer facilities, the storage, the network, and so on. Um, at the back office level, the one but lowest level, you have organizations such as Dance and others um, that uh, supply services for certain dis disciplines. But then also at the universities themselves, we see front offices develop for the communities of that particular university. Or sometimes they are disciplinary organized, uh, also at a European level, um, research infrastructure such as DARIA or CLARIA or SESTA that performs such services to an international audience, um, but for a certain discipline. And we are now also in the process of setting up the so-called uh, coordination point for research data management. And that is a very new initiative. This is because the universities know that uh, or, or, or think that they should collaborate more in this area to, to gain certain economies of scale and to prevent that the wheel is invented uh, at different, uh, uh, different moments and different uh, times all over again. Let's move to the next slide. Because this idea of research data Netherlands is inspired by a report that appeared about five years ago that I would like to mention, and um, that is called Riding the Wave. It was uh, developed by what is now the Research Data Alliance, RDA, very fast-growing international initiative in the area of research data, um, where all disciplines are um, uh, represented. And it has this layered model, and it says that the first recommendation is to develop an international framework for a collaborative data infrastructure. Not any one organization is able to do everything. We should work together and to define tasks. Next slide. I'm approaching the end of my presentation, um, two minutes, I think, in which I would like to mention um, a couple of other large digital humanities initiatives, both internationally and, but with a focus on uh, my own country. You see a couple of logos indicated there. Um, first of all, and I think the speaker before me talked about uh, Daria, um, so you know about that. Clarin is, I guess, also known, which focused on linguistics. And in the Netherlands, Clarin and Daria decided to work together and formed CLARIA. We even combined the acronyms. Um, and it has uh, managed to uh, get a, a, a big amount of money um, focusing on three pillars, so to say. The linguistic pillar, which is the CLARIN part. The socio-economic history pillar, which is focusing more on structured kind of data sources. And um, a pillar focusing on audiovisual data, which is focusing on culture and um, um, what is it called? Uh, communication studies. And um, now I forget the word, but it doesn't matter. Uh, that is the third uh, pillar. Um, also interesting to mention is the Dutch e Science Center, which um, uh, actually also today has a conference focusing on digital humanities projects. Uh, there is uh, some 14 digital humanities project, uh, projects carried out uh, by the eScience Center. And after this presentation, um, I will go there and, and see what, um, what they are doing. Uh, so I can see a bit in the, of the afternoon uh, program uh, uh, listening about um, uh, digital humanities presentations. Um, there is a new initiative um, working to set up the Center for Humanities and Technologies, uh, Technology, and that is to be expected in the next year to, uh, to get shape. It will again be a national um, initiative in which the, uh, the Dutch Academy, uh, uh, universities and the funding organization for research um, collaborate. And also, by the way, IBM, the company, is involved in that initiative. Let's move to the one but last slide. Oops. Yes. 
um, where I just want to show um, what um, Daria and Clary, Claria is, is bringing together. Um, it is a, a national um, in, uh, infrastructure, as I said, uh, for working in the international European um, context, and it's bringing together both the digital humanities projects and the digital humanities courses um, in a registry. And although the registry is uh, not complete yet, um, on the left-hand side you see an impression of the digital humanities projects. So far there is 210 registered over the years, but I can assure you that there is many more. Uh, we don't know yet exactly what we are missing, but we are working on, on that to, to, uh, to get that more uh, complete. I would rather guess that there is in the area of a thousand than um, 210. And the digital humanities courses you can see on the little map on the top right hand side. So this was an attempt in a bird's, as, yeah, a bird's eye perspective on digital humanities the data and projects and infrastructures in the Netherlands with some relationships abroad. I hoped it worked via uh, Skype. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for interesting presentation and sharing with us uh, your experience. And I would like to underline that uh, this is the only chance to address the question to Peter today, because we will not able technically to include him uh, in the last part of uh, this meeting, uh, which will be a discussion. So it's time for. Oh, we have one question. Uh, I wanted to ask about the um, slide where you had uh, the easy archive. You had six different types of metadata for six different areas of research. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. You had uh, this, this, this picture where it was shown that there were, are six different types of metadata for different areas of research. Uh, how big are these differences? Why do you need to have differences? Yes, the differences are not very big. Um, the, the core is every time the same. The difference is mainly uh, in two um, areas. That is um, related to the type of data and the way in which it is collected. Uh, for instance, social scientists um, mainly do uh, questionnaires and interviews. And therefore, they want to know some characteristics about, for instance, the sample size, um, about um, uh, the survey, when, um, how it was uh, conducted. On the other hand, for instance, an archaeologist uh, does an excavation. And for him, it is very important to have, for instance, the location data of where the excavation took place. And that is an example of the kind of, of difference uh, that exists. But I would say that. Um, about 80% of the, of the metadata schema is the same, and only uh, 10 or 20% is different. Um, and um, we are now even working at uh, merging the, different, uh, um, the differences uh, again, as it appears that uh, it's not so difficult um, uh, to do that. Um, only then, uh, in, a, in a couple of cases, it means that some uh, metadata fields are not important for for certain uh, for certain fields or for certain data types. Any other questions? No. Thank you very much uh, for presentation. Um,